Means and mechanisms of citizen participation reflect the degree of political willingness of politicians for democratic practice. This is a direct quote of Brazilian urban planner and architect Maria Caldas, our new guest of our news show on public participation, with our favorite professors, Marta Lora Tamayo Balbe, professor of administrative law, and Antonio Lopez Peláez, professor of social work and social services at UNED. Citizen Participation and Urban Planning, The Case of Brazil. That's the title of the new episode of our show about a country, the legislation of which contemplates public participation as a mandatory task, but not very effective among those citizens that live more precariously financially since they are totally excluded from these practices. These and many other fascinating topics will be dealt with in this space conducted by Marta. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you are listening to this new show, this radio show of the series Outlooks on Public Participation of the Participatory Group, which is a partnership agreement between the City Council of Madrid and UNED to create a community of good practices in the realm of public participation. Today with me are Maria Caldas. Hello, Maria. How are you? Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, exactly. And as usual, Antonio López Peláez, Professor of Social Work. I'm very happy and I love how your glasses match the color of this room. Thank you very much. Today's guest is very special. She is here in the studio face to face with us. It's very difficult for us to get our guest to come here, but she is here to carry out research. So, Maria Caldas, you're an urban planner, an architect, and currently a consultant of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And you've been in politics, or more than politics, you've been in public service, community service, for a long time. And also, you've been a director of infrastructures. Look at this beautiful name. Social and Urban Infrastructure of the Federal Government of Brazil. Antonio, don't you like that? Anyway, it's a luxury to count on her to talk about public participation, which is the topic that moves us, that interests us the most in this show. Maria speaks perfect Spanish. She's prepared this interview perfectly. She might speak a bit of Portuñol, a mixture of Spanish and Portuguese, but we will perfectly understand it. And we think she has a beautiful accent. First of all, the million dollar question, Maria, this is very obvious, but we always need to start with the foundations. What is public participation and why do you think urban planning is fundamental for the management of a city? Thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about a topic that is so key to our cities. What about the million dollar question? Will citizen participation for me is a right that can interfere and lead to significant social changes allowing for the whole society to more equitably share the benefits of urban life. For me, this is an essential practice. I consider it a right because cities are not only a mixture of buildings and infrastructures, but a blend of social relationships happening in the same territory, given the living standards of a city inequality. We can immediately understand how these political and financial and social relationships happen in this society. Most times, balance is only achieved or possible through the opportunity for citizens to participate in the drafting of public policy. How fascinating. It's difficult to strike a balance and it can only be done through participation. There are many different mechanisms and channels for participation. How would you guarantee and ensure fair, equitable public participation. There's a lot of classic literature and research about this topic, but the means and methodologies for public participation reflect the degree of political willingness of politicians for democratic practice. Some strategies are only aimed at the dissemination of public policy, 
redrafting them, manipulating or trying to convince the population. There are also strategies that are just aimed at listening to the opinions of a community without the commitment to abide by them. But there are many ways of participation that try to collectively build public policies and many others that respect the deliberations of the collective, which for me represent the highest level of participatory democracy. In my opinion, an effective participation can only exist when there is a possibility to co-create proposals with citizens and yet always ensuring equality of opportunities to participate for the different groups that have their own self-interests and that live, coexist in the same city. These aspects are especially crucial for societies and countries with a lot of social and financial inequality like Brazil, where a large part of the population lives in precarious situation in urban areas, but they are normally excluded from the processes set up by the government, and the government is heavily influenced by productive sectors and lobbies. Thank you, Maria. I think you hit the nail in the head. We've got many radio show programs where we shared one of the first papers about public participation, The Stare by Arnstein, where he established the different steps and stages of participation, what it was, what it wasn't, if it was about disseminating, convincing, co-creating, which for me is the real expression of participation. We've just had a coffee with a professor who is not very convinced about the outcomes of participatory processes. I think that in this conversation precisely, you were right when you mentioned that participation in countries where democracy is weaker is essential to include those that feel excluded. In this regard, Brazil is an amazing example. They have amazing citizen participation experiences. Please tell us about them. That's why you're here. Could you please summarize a little bit about what the key aspects are or what are the contexts politically and socially where these activities are held? For audience, it's a privilege to have you here because the cradle of the conceptualization of participation, not only in Latin America, but in Europe as well, took place in Belo Horizonte. That was where participation started. So pay attention to Maria's words. Well, Brazilian cities experiment uh, different urban planning projects that had to do with a very sudden urbanization of the country. This happened because there was a lack of housing for workers migrating to cities, so there was a lot of social tension in urban planning and urban policy in the country in general between 1964 and 1985, that means more than 20 years, we lived a military dictatorship which concentrated in the central government all the power and decisions on urban policy and as usual in Latin American cities. They invested on groups that held a lot of the capital and they neglected the poor. At the end of the dictatorship, the social movements that were fighting for urban improvements were very consolidated and were key to impact the new Brazilian constitution. This new constitution established a wide process of decentralization of power, giving political autonomy to cities. At that time, the key words were democracy and citizen participation. In this context, many progressive governments in the cities of Brazil started participatory democracy activities that were very successful with uh, participatory budgets, a very common and well-known example, and the citizens could give their opinion about public policy. There were deliberation associations uh, and gatherings about housing, transportation, etc. This participation allowed us to widen the discussion about uh, 
urban systems and the right to cities as a social conquest. Also, to contribute to strengthening organized social movements that were starting to request the right, to demand the right to participate. Obviously, this didn't happen in every Brazilian city. But it did happen in every city with a progressive government. Citizen participation in the drafting of urban and public policy became a mandatory right in the whole country. But as I was saying before, the level of uh, participation depends on the willingness of governments. After this experience that you've had, I was thinking about Brazil and their evolution and the drama of many rich countries full of poor people, full of people that live a precarious financial situation but also struggle to participate. When you talk about how important participation in cities is, what sorts of outcomes can you expect after your wide experience in this field for so many years and coming from such an advanced country as Brazil? If you carry out a legitimate process of participation, you can expect amazing results like that of the Brazilian constitution stemming from those social movements. I would like to mention Belo Horizonte, a city with around 2.5 million inhabitants, which had for 16 years in a row a progressive government that made many improvements in the participatory realm. Among them, they created an urban participatory management system for the citizens to deliberate, to discuss the master plan and urban legislation. I'd also like to mention an urban policy conference that lasts nine to 12 months with um, around 6 million people participating and later this is followed by the training of participants, reports and deliberation by vote of all the proposals that should be part of our legislation. For this process we choose an equal number, this is important, of delegates representing the business sector the technical sector, but also the popular sector. These representatives have completely different visions for their city, but from their discussions, the government needs to establish a plan closely, abiding by these recommendations with the collaboration of the judicial branch. The government sees the pressure of many interested stakeholders, but that's when the participants of the conference that have made theirs, the debates, mobilize and exercise a lot of popular pressure. They counteract the traditional processes. This is a process that is still in effect. It has been for 25 years and it's led to more political maturity for our society about urban planning, etc. And it's unthinkable to try to modify this system, to modify our legislation consistently or significantly without talking to the population nowadays. How fascinating, especially the creation of an participatory urban management system, participatory from the get-go. I think we could talk about this for many different episodes. In an expert's workshop, we should devote to this topic. We've talked about this a lot. In Europe, participation is still something sophisticated. It's a plus, but it's not, it's not a foundation of political processes. This is one of the lessons that we should learn to contextualize and de- contextualize all of these practices. Now, Maria, what do you think is necessary in all of these systems that you've described where it's also impressive to, to listen to the figures? I mean, for you, they're very insignificant or, or common, but hearing about 6,000 people participating is shocking to us. What would you say is most necessary according to you, to guarantee a good participatory practice. First of all, the existence of political willingness, but clarifying that there are communities where these practices are very consolidated and yet social mobilization can happen organically 
without public powers. This happened in Belo Horizonte during the periods where right-wing conservative governments were in power. This showed the high level of awareness on the rights of our citizens and the mobilization of our population, which is very desirable. I think this is the most desirable situation, the autonomy of social movements and social groups for participation to exist. I also think it's necessary for there to be transparency and trust in politicians for decisions to be respected. And if not, for reasons at least to be explained throughout the process. I think it's also very important to consider the process itself. This is a point that I always like to highlight. As I was saying back in our coffee break, methodologies adopted for discussions are fundamental. Sometimes uh, best of intentions can result in failure if the conditions are not adequate to allow for a fair and equitable debate. That's why having the same number of representatives of different sectors, small details like that can make a huge difference. In this regard, it's essential to have a training, to organize a training process so that everybody can participate in the debate in equal terms, because sometimes they involve very technical matters. Now, this is a very wide topic, but it's important to invest a lot to exercise participatory democracy. Participatory processes require a lot of time, effort and resources for the technicians and the drafting of any document in user-friendly language. Many meetings need to take place on the weekend or outside of their working day so that everybody can participate. In the same way for the population participating, you require a lot of time and effort. They need to attend the meetings and go through the training. It is undoubtedly a challenge that requires technical competence and political willingness. I am convinced that it's not only the best, but the only means to make societies more equal and fairer. How interesting, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you, with Maria, because when one thinks about participation, you think about technical complex processes and you kind of focus on the experts and neglect citizens. Citizens that are not qualified need to participate too, so you need to train them to build capacities to widen participation, to widen the space, the scope of participation, to include citizens in often very unequal and polarized societies is very important because sometimes one of the characteristics of the Brazilian process is that it has included people who otherwise without technical training would be subjected to the decisions of third parties and yet here you are building the capacities of your society. I think it's very important what you're mentioning, that way of focusing on training people to make them capable of participating because Participation is about inclusion and education and sharing your competences and your interactions with others. Something that I also deem very insightful is that, yes, sometimes you need to explain to the participants why their decisions cannot be implemented. But uh, lack of consensus is not an offense. We can reach reasonable agreements that are sustainable in time, that are feasible. You are kind of amplifying the space to other participants in such a convulsed moment like the one we are living. Thank you so much for listening to us today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. UNED is always by your side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. It's been a pleasure and a luxury to count on you in this radio program. There'll be many more to come. We'd also like to thank our technicians as usual since they're always working very hard. You cannot even imagine, those of you listening, how easy our work is when we get to the room and everything's ready to go. Everything's ready, everything's perfect. The room, the microphones, the recording. We need to recognize those working with us in this show. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you.